So um, today I'm going to talk to you about this topic of effective software and systems traceability. And um, this is an area that I've been working in for about 15 years. And um, so anyway, it's my pleasure to come here. I know there's a lot of people in this research group here that are working on software traceability problems. So it's actually really exciting for me to come and um, be able to talk with you about some of the things we're doing and to um, have look at some areas of overlap. But what this talk is about, first of all, um, certainly it's going to be about traceability and I'm going to start the talk in a minute by giving an, a, a, a kind of an introduction to those of you who are not familiar with what traceability is so if it's not your area then hopefully within about 10 or 15 minutes you will know what it is so I want to talk about that secondly traceability is a challenging problem for a number of reasons so kind of throughout the talk I want to discuss how do we go about tackling a hard, multifaceted problem? Because a lot of software engineering problems are just not clean, you know, cut. You have to um, solve them within the context of the software engineering environment. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And finally, how do we team with our industrial partners? I know you're particularly good at that too, but we want to make sure that we're addressing the right problems and that the, the results that we deliver or that we discover, we can actually move them on towards practice. So first of all, what is traceability? Well, this is a definition here that was put out um, for software traceability by the Center of Excellence for Software Traceability. But in a nutshell, traceability is about connecting things. So when you build a software product, you're going <clears> to <throat> write requirements, you're going to have some kind of design, you're going to um, have code, you're going to have test cases and test results. If it's a safety critical system, you're going to do a hazard analysis and you'll identify faults that if they occur could contribute to that hazard taking place. So these are the kind of things that are part of uh, are the byproduct or the products of the software engineering process. And traceability is all about connecting those things together. And the reason that we have traceability is to support these kinds of things. So it supports regulatory compliance. For regulatory compliance um, reasons, you know, you might want to connect your requirements and your design or your test case back up to regulatory codes that provide, that are used then for certification processes. <coughs> um, it supports things like change impact analysis, safety analysis, is this software safe for use? So that's the motivation behind um, why we ha actually have to have traceability. So here's an example of using traceability to achieve regulatory compliance. Now I do a lot of work with Siemens, um, specifically in their um, positive train control systems. And for them, they have many, many, many different regulatory codes that their systems must comply to. And they have to demonstrate that by putting all the traceability links into place. So they've got test cases, code, design and all of these things they have to show satisfies those regulatory codes and that's what traceability is. So it's about creating a trace matrix, um, maybe in a spreadsheet, maybe through an automated tool that captures the relationships between things and then we can use that information to answer important questions about the system. Like for example, you know, are all the regulatory codes that are relevant to this system, are they um, satisfied in the system? So what does traceability actually look like? Well, here we see this happy chap um, sitting at his computer and he's you know, got all these different artifacts. He has some hazards, he has faults that can contribute to it. Um, for each of those faults, we have mitigating requirements or design constraints, things that the system must do to prevent the faults from occurring so that we can prevent the hazards from occurring and we can demonstrate that the system is safe for use. And then the test cases, there's no point having requirements if you can't demonstrate that your as-delivered system actually satisfies them and that the test cases pass. Um, there's something really, really wrong with this picture though. And um, I'm not going to make you guess, but you can think about it. And the, the thing that's really wrong with it is this guy looks far, far, far too happy and actually this guy is much more like a real tracer at work. So. With my students, when they first join my research lab, because most of our research is in the, in the area of traceability, I always give them a tracing task to do. It's usually something we actually really need done. And when, by the time they've finished establishing all these trace links, they suddenly realize, oh my gosh, this is really boring to do. 
And that is the thing. In you know, establishing all the trace links that we need takes a lot of time, um, a lot of effort. So this is an example of a Cisco system. Actually, these are some obfuscated requirements from a, a, a Siemens project that I'm working on, but this graph is from a Cisco system. In this particular system, you can see the number of requirements grew to about 100,000, and at the same time, the number of related trace links grew up to about 190,000. So that's 190,000 times somebody has to say this requirement relates to this bit of the design, or this bit of the design relates to that. That's incredibly arduous. And so we get this kind of thing going on. Too much <coughs> tracing. It's not fun at all. Of course, there are a lot of industrial tools that exist, and um, some of you may recognize this as DOORS. So it's an IBM tool now. Um, and basically, it's a requirements management tool, so a lot of industries working on big projects will keep their requirements in here. It's just basically like a database with many features. It provides drag and drop um, facilities, so you can kind of click on something here in one module and you can drag it into another and establish a trace link, and then you can actually add attributes to that trace link. Um, that's about as good as kind of the current state of practice gets in terms of traceability. It's far from automated, but if you talk to them about automation, they'll say, yes, we have automation because we have these great drag and drop facilities inside our requirements management tools. It doesn't solve any of the problems. And one of the real problems in, when it comes to traceability in industry is not just creating these trace links in the first place, but it's maintaining them as the system changes over time. And that's incredibly difficult and incredibly arduous for people to do. Um, so there have been a number of um, major research advances in this area. And um, a lot of people, including my own research group, over the last decade, um, 10 to 15 years, have been working in this area of automating traceability. So it's a little bit like kind of Google for software engineering. So the idea is that if you look at the artifacts of the software engineering process, here we've got requirements, some kind of um, state chart, some structured models, and then the code, it all has text in it. Even the visual models, they have text in it, and we can basically use information retrieval methods to um, kind of search for, um, for links or similarities between requirements and other things. So a lot of people have worked on this kind of problem for the past decade. And, um, and then another area that there um, is currently major um, you know, advances in is this other idea of kind of monitoring the project environment and capturing project exhaust. So when I say project exhaust, what I mean is you know, you're building a software system and you check things into your version control, you write comments, um, you check some things in together, so you can gather all this information and from it you can infer what belongs together. So you check in, you know, you, you modify a requirement and then you go and make some changes to the design. So those kind of things tell us, in, they give us hints about what relationships go together and people have been quite successful in, um, you know, capturing this kind of information. So, um, here is um, an example of a first generation trace retrieval solution. I call it first generation. It's actually the um, tool Poro that we built in my research group um, when I, about 12 years ago when I first had just graduated with my um, PhD. And you can see up at the top here you have what we call a query. In this case it's actually a regulatory code. And what we want to do is to trace it through to the requirements. So we use our information retrieval methods. We compute the similarity between this query and um, the requirement, and then we return a ranked list showing the ones that are most similar. And um, so we ran some, a number of pilot studies with our industry collaborators, and we found um, that it wasn't quite good enough because when you do this, you basically, if you look at how, how well, how accurately we retrieved the correct requirements that are truly related to that regulatory code, we found that we were getting recall of about 90%. That means out of all the requirements that we should have retrieved, we got about 90% of them. And then precision, as you're going to see in another slide in a minute, was all over the place, but it was never really that great. So it wasn't quite good enough for them to use, so we added these kind of features 
that allows the user to kind of interact with the query and to modify the query by adding terms, deleting terms, so that it could kind of um, recompute similarities and pull the good things up to the top. So that was our first generation tool. We were proud of it and um, we wanted to see how well it would do in industry, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Um, it was really representative, though, of um, the work that I think seminal work, I could say, that um, Giulio Antonio and others on his team started in 2001. And I think he was the first, first person, or his team, were the first people that came up with the idea of basically using information retrieval as a traceability tool. And what I want to show you here uh, is that this is actually a um, graph that I took out of his TSE paper, um, which was appeared in 2002. And what, we're 2015 now, so we're about 13 years later. And we've been working on this problem, many of us, for, you know, off and on during that time. And if I were to go and plot my graph today, it is not going to be so different to that graph. I have to be honest. So basically, we're trying to solve a problem that we haven't yet been able to solve. And I'm going to, most of my talk today is going to be how we think we can solve it. So I'll move on and talk about that in a little bit. Um, anyway, as I said, we ran a pilot study. We've run several of these. And this was like our first pilot study with um, beyond the initial kind of proof of concept. And we ran a couple of experiments at Siemens on their positive train control system. And the first one was about the accuracy of links, and the second one was, can we use information retrieval methods just to identify segments of, of the regulatory codes that are actually relevant to, the, um, to their requirements? So we ran it on these two regulatory codes, ARIMA and ca this CANSA. And um, you know, basically, if you look at our results, so here I'm reporting you know, when we ran our algorithms, the results at recall values of 70%, 80%, and 90%. And of course, industry wants high recall. You know, in fact, if I go to industry today and I say, you know, we can do better than this now anyway, but if I go to them today and I say, um, well, our tool will give you 90% of the links you need, then the thing they always say to me, and they have said many times, is, Where, what about the other 10%? So. This is an example where, as an academic, it's not good enough. It's, it can't be the final resting place and us thinking we have succeeded in technology transfer if we only deliver 90%. It's not good enough. Um, and anyway, at 90%, you can see that you know, precision is very kind of low, hovering around the 10% mark. Um, that may sound horrible, but the good thing about it is a metric I'm not actually showing here, which is specificity. Specificity is another metric that measures our ability to reject links that we don't want. And specificity for both of these projects is very high, up in about 99%. So we basically get rid of a lot of links that we don't want, and we um, get some that we, um, that we don't want, you know, in the kind of imprecise results. So anyway, you know, we, we ran our pilot study, and again, our industry collaborators said, not good enough. It's not going to solve our problem. We need to do better if we're going to have an automated solution. OK, so I'm going to take a second to kind of put a little structure around my talk. Um, I've introduced what traceability is about, about connecting um, kind of things together, establishing trace links. I've shown you the tools we can use to do that. And I've talked a little bit about the initial early state of the art in the field in this area of requirements traceability. Um, so I've done that already, and I'm going to move on. Very, very briefly, I want to talk about um, the future of software engineering. It's a, um, a, a, a special track in the International Conference on Software Engineering. Every, I think, five years or so, um, there's a track where people get invited to talk about um, challenges in their fields and how each field's going. And we were able to have a paper on traceability. So I'm going to very briefly talk about this before moving on. So one thing we have noticed in the traceability area that motivates a lot of our work is that this traceability gap exists. Now, I've explained to you what traceability is, and I've said we use it for safety analysis and for compliance verification. Most systems that insist on traceability are safety critical in nature. That means that we have to demonstrate that those systems are safe, and traceability 
is a, a very major part in helping us make, make, show that in a demonstrable way. So traceability is really important. But we performed a number of studies. Um, first of all, we worked with the Food and Drug Administration in the US. They're responsible for um, approving medical devices for release to the public in the US. So obviously medical devices invade our bodies, like infusion pumps, laser surgery, um, laser knives for surgery. They must be safe. And the FDA actually asked us to collaborate with them because they noticed that when organizations were submitting their documentation for approval, <coughs> that the traceability was horrendously lacking. And yet, the FDA somehow had to try and figure out if the implemented delivered system actually managed to mitigate, um, to address the mitigating requirements, address the faults, and whether it would be safe for use. So there's lots of things that people um, do wrong. And then we did another study. Um, I did it with some collaborators, Patrick Mader and um, one of his students, Patrick Rempel. And we took a number of safety critical systems. I think we had seven of them. We modeled them for, um, we, we looked at the regulatory, um, the prescribed traceability requirements that came in the kind of prescription for how those systems should be built. So they're basically, um, you know, written into the standards. In this case, do 178B, which is for kind of the avionic field. We took their prescribed traceability, what they required organizations to do. We modeled it in this formal model. And then we went and looked at the actual software. We wrote all sorts of scripts. We passed it. We created these models. And what we found is the traceability gap. Across about seven different systems, no system that was submitted or that we looked at actually did what the um, what the standards told them to do. So we have a problem here because we have, you know, software that's being built for safety critical domains. We have standards that tell us how this software is to be developed. And we have like large, you know, practices, common practices that completely fail to meet that. So those are some of the questions we're trying to look at, like which one is right? You know, do we need to do better giving industry better tracing tools so that they can meet that bar? Or do those standards need to change? And that's like an open question. Um, so anyway, we have a traceability problem and we might ask, you know, after all this time, people have been working on this problem since about 1995, why is it so hard to solve? Why don't we do better? Why are standards requiring something, but industry very frequently being unable to deliver it across you know, many different industries? And I think one of the reasons it's so hard to solve is because there's three perspectives. And um, you can't solve the traceability problem without bringing a solution that hits all three of these perspectives. So a lot of areas of um, computer science research you know, you can come up with some algorithm, it solves a problem, and your job as a researcher is done. Like one of my collaborators at DePaul in Chicago works on recommender systems. So they get data from Amazon, they get data from Google, they come up with these new algorithms. If they can prove that their new algorithm um, gets better hit ratios when they make recommendations, then Google or Amazon are thrilled with them. I think Netflix is one of their main customers, and their job is done. That's not the case for our kind of software engineering research. We have to understand the, the larger context and we have to overcome a number of burdens or barriers in order to see our, our work get into industry. So the first is this goal-oriented perspective. If people in industry don't even, they don't want to do tracing. You know, many of them don't want to do it because it's boring, it's arduous, it takes a lot of time. I've, I've talked to many people from safety critical domains and they've told me that they only put their trace links in place immediately before the certification effort. I know this for fact. And the problem with that is of course they hate it because of course what that means is they trace only for compliance purposes and they get none of the other benefits back from, you know, from, from tracing. So we need to do a better job understanding the goals. Um, traceability needs to be purposed, so they need to understand that. Trusted, no point having lots of trace links if in the end people don't trust them and don't use them. That also is a current state of practice right now, that people don't trust them. 
scalable, we need to be able to do it quickly and scale up to large numbers and all these kind of things. So that's the first perspective. The second is process. So traceability really impacts process. We're not just building an algorithm that just fits behind the scenes somewhere. We're building tools, we're building solutions that um, have to fit into the process. There's four major kind of elements to the traceability process. We've got to create links, we have to use them, and using of course means building tools that actually work for people in industry within the context that they need to actually have those links available. We have to plan and manage traceability strategically. Without that, it's going to be ad hoc and we won't have our environment correctly instrumented to support it. And then, this nasty thing down here, we have to maintain trace links as the system evolves. And um, I will say this, if you talk to any traceability researcher, they will most probably tell you that traceability supports long-term maintainability of the system. But what they won't tell you is our dirty little secret that it also makes it harder to maintain. Because now, you not only have to change the system, but you have to change the trace links to go along with that system. So it makes it easier and it makes it harder, all at the same time. And researchers, you know, which part of this do you think researchers like working on the most? Any guesses? Creating, Creating. yes. Oh, I guess my little graph is here. But it's like, it's more fun because we like algorithms. And it's like we get our hands dirty and we try new algorithms and they generate new trace links and we can measure them and we can see did we do better. But the problem is we will never deliver a working traceability solution unless we tackle all of these things. And then finally, just to make matters even worse, you can't, do trace, you can't deliver traceability solutions without looking at the context, the environmental context. So we have this kind of technical perspective. And again, you know, the area that people like working in is up here, in the area of the trace engine. We like delivering algorithms. But there's all of this. And, and um, you know, the worst bit of it is the messy bottom. I'll call it that. And what that means is data doesn't come neatly packaged. It's in PDFs. It's distributed around the world. It's hiding in different tools that are not compatible. Fortunately, there are nowadays, recently, some really cool tools that are getting better at kind of connecting heterogeneous data sets. But the fact is, traceability has to deal with all of those things before we can actually make any difference. Okay, so um, th that's kind of like the state of art and state of practice. And in our future of software engineering, uh, we came up with a number of research directions that I'm not going to talk about today. I'm only going to take a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to move on to one specific area. But we identified things such as, um, you know, planning and managing. Um, we have to take care of these things. Um, knowledge reuse. The need for more intelligence, which I am going to focus on in the rest of my talk today. Um, this whole idea of monitoring the environment. We can do a much, much better job um, of knowing what should be traced to each other and helping humans make those decisions if we monitor that environment. Um, traceability for self-adapting systems. As things change, how do those traceability links evolve with them? How do we maintain and evolve trace links over time? I have a PhD student working on that right now. Um, how can we build links and maintain them so that they will be trusted and let people know when they can't trust them. So how can we maintain a trusted set of, of links? Um, if I had time, I would talk about all these things. They're all um, interesting. And then, of course, creating and using trace queries, which I am going to touch on later on, and then visualizing and understanding the results. So um, traceability is not just about creating those links. If you remember, there was another side to the definition it's about creating the links and then using them to answer or to support activities that software engineers need to do. So we need to be able to visualize them or contextualize the results in ways that are useful for our users. Okay, so in the remainder of my time, I'm gonna focus on this one area, which was one of the research directions that was identified in the future of software engineering. And, um, so I'm going to go on and talk about that towards more intelligent tracing solutions. And um, in, in particular, I'm going to talk about four 
different aspects of that um, as long as time allows. So, you know, we, we spent some time and we thought about, you know, the problem I showed you earlier. I showed you the graph that came out of Giulio Antonio's work. And in that graph, and I told you that basically after about a decade of many researchers working on this problem, we haven't really done much better. So a couple of years ago, we sat back and said, look, you know, we, we, get, we keep tweaking slightly better results. Uh, we run new experiments, and then this algorithm works a little bit better on that data set, and this one works a little better on that data set. But actually, we're not really improving things. Um, we're improving, you know, we're getting improvements of like 2 or 3% in precision and recall on one data set and then not on another. But when you put that into the context of software engineers, 3% um, improvement in the accuracy of a set of retrieved links is actually meaningless. And um, we kind of caught on to this, um, you know, because in, in other areas of data mining, like for example in the area of recommender system, if you get even a 0.5% improvement, that can actually translate in the algorithm to many, you know, hundreds of thousands of extra dollars in sales or something like that. So in that particular context, small improvements in precision and recall make a tremendous difference. But in our field of software engineering, when we're presenting this list of, of artifacts to the users to evaluate and use, that 1% doesn't make a difference, especially as we're not consistently improving 1% every month, you know, and making it really better. So we thought about this and we thought, okay, we've hit a glass ceiling. Why are our information retrieval methods not doing better? And so of course we think, we're thinking around the problem and if you think about it, you know, in Google, for example, very little of their, re of their um, search results are based on kind of, of, of term similarity. A lot of it is based on things like page rank algorithms, kind of click through, looking at what results other people that issued similar queries liked before. But in our problem, we don't have that volume of data. So we basically are going almost cold turkey every time somebody does a, a trace. So we ran up against this kind of the, the glass ceiling that's caused by mismatch in terms. Terms don't match. We can use project glossaries. We can um, kind of have matching term lists. But in the end, you've got this mismatch of terms, and I think that's why after over a decade, we're not seeing the breakthrough that we needed. So we had a kind of thinking about what, what we should do. Should we give up this area? Is it never going to work? And we thought, well, if humans can do it, surely we need to think more about how humans look at you know two different artifacts and determine if they are linked together and they surely humans do much more than just kind of you know look for matching words and things like that so we came up with this hypothesis that real advancements in traceability that make a difference will only be achieved as we transition towards more intelligent traceability solutions and by that we meant solutions that more closely mimic the way the human performs the task so this is actually very, very challenging. Everybody knows that you know, all the AI kind of research from you know, a couple of decades ago, and um, you know, has, has, there's many great things that have come out of it. We see robots today, you know, robotics today. We see all sorts of intelligence. But there's a number of really hard problems, and they never really you know, were completely able to achieve. And in fact, I, I shared this um, hypothesis at one meeting one time, and people started arguing that's exciting, and then no, it's doomed, and, and this kind of thing. So we have a challenging problem, but it also gives us a way around the problem. Um, we also did an analysis, and we looked at the papers that had kind of published on trace um, automation over basically um, for 10 years, and um, we looked to see you know, which ones use term matching versus basic untyped associations, semantic associations, and then expert systems. So our kind of conjecture was that you have this kind of increasing level of intelligence as you go up this spectrum. So the most basic of these term matching ones, and then you kind of go to these associations, and then you start taking semantics into consideration. And then at the top, in addition to taking semantics into consideration, you put reasoning, you can reason over the relationships between the semantic concepts. 
And then this other kind of area here is um, knowledge synthesis. So we kind of synthesize all sorts of things together. So we did an analysis of these papers, and you can see over 10 years, you know, this is where we're stuck, term-based algorithms. And this one little slither here represented about two, not just 2%, but, you know, a couple of papers, uh, one of which was our own paper, that tried to go, you know, up here into this whole kind of expert system space up here and try to solve the problem that way. Okay, so then this question comes to mind. If we believe in our hypothesis, or we want to test our hypothesis, we have to ask what goes through a domain expert's mind as he or she performs the tracing task. Because in the end, we want to build a system that does that, you know, or something like that. So, you know, we started to think about how humans think about these concepts. And here you can see a regulatory code um, and a requirement from the system that was under development. And this is basically a, um, a, a system for driverless vehicles. And, um, you know, here's Tom, and he has to think about how to trace that. So this is the kind of thing that automated tools would previously would get stuck on, but he knows lots of stuff. He knows that WIU, okay, we can get this from the project glossary, but he knows that means a wayside unit, interface unit, and he also knows that it's located in a highway wayside segment. He knows that broadcast is similar to transmit, so there's some kind of group of of um, verbs that kind of mean the same thing. He knows that an automobile controller is part of the automobile, that WSM and wayside status message are equivalent, and so on. So there's lots and lots of information that the domain expert brings to the problem in order to solve it. And this is far, far more than, at that time, any trace retrieval algorithm was trying to capture. So this is our goal, capture this. And, and not only does he know these things, but he knows how to kind of synthesize them and reason about them. So there's kind of rules that go through his mind. He knows things like conditions, and he can understand when exceptions occur, and that's what we have to try and build into our new tracing algorithms. Um, so this was my team for this job. Jingu is one, my PhD student. Um, this is apparently a baby photo of this um, person that I recruited to my team. Um, I was meant to replace it a long time ago, but he's a lot older than that now. But he's um, actually, a, he has a bachelor's degree in linguistics, so I recruited him to my team because obviously there's a, a lot of natural language processing and then a programmer at the time. So we came up with this idea of action frames. And um, an action frame is defined. So what we want to do is take these sentences, break them down into action frames, and then see which action frames go together and from there we can infer our trace links. So an action frame, um, the first thing you have to do is identify verbs and then verbs have two kind of ways we have to think about them. First of all, we think of it in terms of a usage group and this is more to do with the kind of the grammar and um, how things go together. So you, when you have this kind of verb, what other parts of speech is it going to interact with in order to make a this um, kind of action frame. And then it also has a semantic type. So it has a meaning. And we're going to use the semantic type when it comes to establishing trace links. But first, we have to use the verb's usage group. So once we know its usage group, then we have a set of rules that tells us which other parts of speech or which other dependencies connect to it and what roles they play. And then we can assign thematic roles. Um, then we come up with a semantic group, and once we have the semantic group for each action um, unit, then we can apply these heuristics and come up with tracing. So I'm going to show you an example, okay, because that's all a bit theoretical. So here we have our first artifact. Any critical failure during the disengage mode will force the OBM to enter the failed mode. So first of all, we look for the verb from which we can create one of these action frames. Obviously, everyone can see the verb is enter, so there we have it. Um, so now the next thing we're going to do is figure out um, what usage group it belongs to. It's usage group three. Usage groups are kind of hidden from humans, um, except for us, so we don't give them fancy names. Um, but semantic groups are going to kind of be more visible, so it has to have a, semantic, a meaningful name, and this is motive, so we've looked that up. We use the Stanford parser, so it generates a dependency tree, so it's kind of like it, it extracts kind of like um, dependencies of parts of speech. 
and um, then we use the action unit extraction rules so each usage group has 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 extraction rules um, usage group three the extraction rules tell us that we have to look for two things we have to look for a theme and we have to look for a location and a lot of the theory of this comes from linguistics theory we didn't make this up so in this example um, it tells us that the role of the theme is played by the subject. So we use the results of the Stanford parser to look for the subject and we pop it in here. And it tells us that the role of location is played by the object. So we go and find the object and we place it in here and now we have our action unit. So we do that for all of our, um, you know, for, for everything that we want to trace. We have a number of different thematic roles. You can see the ones that turned out to be most relevant for us. In the linguistics literature, there's about a thousand thematic roles. We found seven that were particularly useful for us in, um, in our kind of domain. So here's an example of matching. And um, something kind of went funny here, but I am running my, my um, window slides on the Mac. So I think if only a few layout issues happen, then we're in pretty good shape. Um, so here we have the first artifact up here and then the second artifact down here. So we're going to start the tracing process. Um, okay, so it didn't completely match up. You have to imagine that things are in the right place. Um, so we have the semantic group here, transmissive and transmissive. They match up, okay? So that's something we know about it. Um, so we're trying, first of all, to apply, we have a number of different heuristics. One heuristic is a, called basic match. Basic match applies if the semantic groups match. In this case, they do match. So the next job we have to do is to follow the link heuristic rules for the basic match. And we have to compare agents, recipients, and instruments. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but this has an underlying ontology related to it. In the ontology, we have all of these kind of concepts that are needed to support this, and they're related through relationships. Is a relationship part of relationships? So when you try to match agents, in this case, we're trying to match the, the agent WIU and Wayside Segment, you can match them because they're the same, the same word, which they're not here, or you can match them through the ontology because there's some kind of relationship at different levels of abstraction, or because they're a synonym, or because they're an expansion of the term, or something like that. So in this case, we match um, the, um, the agents. It's correct. Whoops, something happened. Yeah, okay. Hopefully, yay, okay. <laughs> That'll wake us all up. Um, so then we match the recipients, we match the, um, and, then we, and then there are no instruments, so we don't have to match that. And then we come down to the next rule, which says we compare theme and location, and it gives us rules for how they have to match together. So we check that, and we find it matches. So in fact, after matching all of these things, we find that we've met all the requirements for a basic match to be in place, and we have a link. Um, our approach right now just looks for um, matching one action group with um, one action group in the other artifact. And the, the biggest mistake that, so it works quite well, I'll show you the results later on, but the biggest mistake we make is because we don't take constraints into account, conditions. Because um, we only, if, if one action group matches another, then we say it's a link. But actually, you know, what if one of the artifacts said, unless? And then we should kind of be able to deal with that, and we haven't done that yet. Um, here's another example, it's just going to fly by. Um, this is a different heuristic, it's called the transmissive receptive. This one applies if one semantic group is receptive and one is semantic. And then, of course, we have, um, you know, the same thing. We use the usage groups to create the action frames. So here we have two created action frames. And then we start doing the comparisons and see if through the ontology they match at the right levels. Um, and then finally, if everything matches up, we can say we have a link. We currently have 24 different um, groups. Now, you need to remember all of this because this is just the beginning of the story. This was for our proof of concept. 
So we wanted to build this expert system. And what we, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. You've got to know what are the usage groups. You've got to know, you know, what are the semantic groups? What are the rules for building the action frames? Um, what are the trace link heuristics? And what is the ontology for this domain? So all of those things have to be in place before this thing will actually work. So our first experiment that we did in this basically said, if those things are in place, um, if we have an ontology, if we have all these rules in place, can we get good traceability? Because you have to start somewhere. And, um, but what we're working on now is, OK, how do we learn all these things? And that's an even more challenging problem. Um, so anyway, here's DOSA in a nutshell. Um, all the regulatory codes and requirements are passed into these action units. And then trace links are established between them using these trace link heuristics. And um, the entire process is supported by this knowledge base, which is basically an ontology of domain concepts. So this needs to know things like WIU is a wayside interface unit and much more sophisticated relationships than just these synonym expansions. So that's DOSIT in a nutshell. And um, these were the results from our first work that we published at um, ASE um, conference last year. And um, basically, this is the one that counts. This is the, um, the precision and recall of using the vector space model. Um, we've done a number of experiments and compared different um, techniques. The vector space model actually performs very, very well compared to any other information retrieval approach um, like LSI, LDA. Um, it's, it's not often outperformed by them, even on large data sets, we found. Um, but here's our dosit result. So basically, you know, up, we're still missing a few, and partly this is because we need to build a better domain ontology, but you can see that we're getting very, very, very much more accurate results. But there's a big proviso. Remember I said you have to have all that infrastructure in place in order for this to work. So now as researchers, you know, we have to make a choice. We, do we believe that this could work? Can we actually automate the creation of all that infrastructure because I'll tell you, it took a long time to build it manually. And um, so now we're kind of betting our future research that, we, that that's what we're going to try to do because we're not going to get around that glass ceiling by just trying another algorithm to match terms when the terms don't match. So we have to build a much more sophisticated model that's more capable of thinking in the way that a human would be able to think. Okay, so then we come on to this area of acquiring domain knowledge. And this is what we've... So actually, what we wanted to do was now go to full automation. Learn everything, you know, come up with solutions for that. But what we found is we have to um, kind of work on this first. We need to have the domain ontology. Anybody who has done any work in the area of ontology building, has anyone here worked in that area? Um, it's very difficult. Um, learning a complete and a correct ontology for a domain, um, there's a whole community of researchers that spend all their time working on it and still don't necessarily succeed in doing this. So we have a small secret trick, um, we think it is, and it's kind of like part of, what our, our, part of what we're trying to leverage to make this work, but it's incredibly a difficult task to build um, basically a knowledge base for a specific domain especially because the domains we are working in are safety critical and that means that some of them many of them are very complicated so for example positive train control has you know all this vocabulary that we now we kind of know a lot of it but it's complex and complex relationships between things my students are i would say now experts in positive train control because of all this work they've done so we've shown that DOSIT can deliver accurate links if it has all this knowledge, but how are we going to learn these things? So we need to learn domain facts, verb facts, dependency mappings, link heuristics, all of that stuff. And then, of course, the other question is, how much of it carries over from one domain to another? You know, you would hope that lots of the things that we build, we can carry from one domain to another. But how can we test that? Because we don't have multiple domains because we have to build the domain ontology for each domain. So we can't get enough data points to even start asking how much carries over 
until we can try it out in different domains, and it takes so long to build that domain ontology. So we're working on automating it, and I'll show you what we've been able to do and you know where we're at today. Um, as of about three nights ago, when in the middle of a night we submitted our paper to the FSE conference. Okay, so you can remember Tom and the kind of things Tom knows. So these are the kind of facts we would like to put into our domain ontology. But actually, while my students were busy working on this one day, I kind of felt inclined to actually go and understand the problem a little bit more. So I wrote up some little programs, and we have our three domains, um, DVC, our driverless vehicle controller, which is obfuscated from another secret domain, um, electronic healthcare um, records, and then um, medical infusion pumps. So these are our three domains. And so, first of all, we have a tool that we developed a long time ago that basically extracts domain-specific um, nouns and domain-specific noun phrases. So it basically creates noun, you know, identifies nouns and noun phrases, and then it does the very same thing for a mass of non-domain-related documents that actually include romance novels and astronomy books and all sorts of stuff. And um, from that, we identify domain-specific terms and phrases. So for DVC, you know, out of, I should, I should say as well, our industrial collaborators gave us about 100 gigabytes of data from this domain, actually. And so we analyzed all of that data, and we found um, domain-specific single words, uh, actually, I should have said single nouns, was 13,960. And um, that produced 104 thousand approximately um, domain specific phrases that's a lot do we expect all of those and their relationships to go into our domain ontology and how are we going to learn that that's a challenge this second row here was the same analysis done on the software artifacts so on the requirements the design specifications from that domain you can see there's far fewer so it's like at first we thought yes we're going to be able to find all these in the domain do documents and um, they'll we'll have great coverage. This is the actual coverage we got. Even the, given the fact that we had 100 gigabytes of domain documents, we still only found 23% of, the, of the, the terms in our software artifacts were actually in those domain documents. That's surprising. And only 37% of the phrases. So what this tells us is if we use those documents to mine our ontology, we're only going to have a partial ontology still. So this was kind of a bit of an eye-opener for us at the beginning of the project. And um, we did the same analysis for these two other domains. As a by comment, an extra comment, um, you know, I was very surprised by these numbers for the medical infusion pump. Why is this coverage so high? And this is a kind of completely separate comment, but DVC is an industrial data set through and through. EHR is actually also an industrial data set. It's, um, we took the requirements for um, kind of certification um, of healthcare IT systems in the US, and there's many, many requirements for that, and we trace them against the World Vista, uh, which is a healthcare system in the US. So those are also in, you know, industrial systems. This one um, basically was created by academics, and um, what it is is requirements that they wrote for medical infusion pumps. They're great requirements, there's nothing wrong with them, but you know, when we saw this we thought, aha, they must have read the same domain documents that we read, and they must have got all of their vocabulary from those domain documents, because that's how they gained their domain expertise and were able to do this. The side comment here is, if we didn't do industrial research, and if we only did our research based on um, kind of like quasi-academic documents, we would have a completely different picture of what this domain and what this whole job or this whole challenge looks like than we got because we did all of this analysis. Um, okay, so now we get on to learning the domain ontology. So this is our kind of hot off the press um, results. We took all of the domain documents, we also took the project artifacts. We also want to learn phrases and, and things from them. And we put them through um, a number of tools. I don't even show all the tools that we used here. 
Um, we have a lexical syntactic pattern extractor. So that's very commonly used in um, ontology building. Basically, it means you look for you you define as regular expressions pa um, typical patterns that occur in text. Like um, you know, x is um, you know is found in y. So there would be a pattern. So there's many many patterns. There's different ways you can learn the patterns. We created them manually by a lot of inspection by my linguist, which is when it's good to have a linguist on the team. Um, so this was the one that, you know, we had the best hope of, of finding these um, kind of on these facts. Uh, we used association rule minor, a minor. So that's like if you go to the supermarket, um, they always do association rule mining on your purchases. So it's like they know things like if you buy um, beer and diapers, you're more likely to also buy. Anyone know? Milk. Um, that's a fact, <laughs> at least in the US. It's, I don't know if it's the same here. Okay, this thing wants to really misbehave this time. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, topic modeling. So we basically, um, I don't have time to talk about this. It's more than just simple topic modeling, but we used LDA to identify a large number of very small topics and then we looked for how frequently facts appear together in the same topic. One of the interesting things is of course the le lexical syntactic pattern extractor not only extracts relationships between terms but it knows what those relationships probably are or possibly are. Whereas this just knows that there's relationships between things and it can't tell you what those relationships are. So we have this fourth thing, the semantic relatedness computer. Um, it basically uses WordNet and it tries to infer what the relationship type is between these things. Um, okay, now our secret weapon, um, because all this stuff is kind of stuff that ontology researchers have been doing for years and it's still very challenging. So we thought, because of course we are traceability researchers, but we have more knowledge than they do because we have, for these safety critical systems, examples of things that go together. And we know, for example, let me see if, no. <laughs> it's just not gonna like me today. Okay, so we know that, you know, if one artifact is traced to another, maybe a regulatory code is traced to a requirement, with, a, with an accepted, validated trace link, we know that relationships exist between those two things. So now instead of just you know, blindly searching for relationships between things, we can do a targeted search. So we know that if there's a trace link between a regulatory code and a requirement, and we cannot explain it in our existing ontology, that we know that some relationship exists with some, between some pair of nouns or noun phrases. So now we're going to search for the most likely explanation. It's a little bit like um, the Jeopardy game. You know, you have the answer and now you've got to go and find the question. In this case, we know they're related. Now we have to go and discover why. And um, so that basically means that in our approach, we um, feed it from, you know, from the trace links. We feed it pairs of noun phrases and we go and search for those relationships and then we do some um, different, and uh, we actually build this profile of candidate facts and um, I'll show you this in more detail on the next page. And then we, um, so this profile of candidate facts has facts along here and then the profile of all the results that come out of our extraction tools. And um, then we, trained this using a classifier. So we basically create a classifier then that can is trained to differentiate between incorrect and um, correct facts. So the user obviously, which was us, had to go and train it by giving it examples of correct facts, examples of incorrect facts. Um, we did the training and so we created this candidate fact classifier, which now given new pairs of facts, it can classify them and tell us which ones to put in the ontology or not. That's the idea. It is, with, as with most NLP things, a little bit messy and doesn't, you know, it sounds good, but um, here's our class, here's our profile and um, here's some of the results. You can see basically um, we were able to achieve, you know, accuracy of about 0.78 for 
0.74, and then for um, DVC, it's not quite as good. It's still at 0.68. So definitely, you know, room for improvement. Um, so we have to put the cumin in the loop. So we built this tool. It does some things that are a little similar to some of the things that your research group here is um, doing in kind of clustering um, things together. So um, basically, we ask the user, we give them facts, and each of these contains kind of clusters of similar noun phrases, and um, they can choose which version they want to kind of use to build the relationship. And um, so given a trace link, if we generate a trace link, instead of just asking them to accept or reject it, we ask them to build ontology at the same time, and we give them this kind of help to build the ontology. Um, and here is um, a small part of our ontology. It's imperfect, and um, some parts of our ontology looked messier than others, and much worse than this. So anyway, that's where we're at right now. Okay. Um, so then we came up with this idea, which was our research work last summer, of um, kind of building a mega genetic, a, a mega chromosome. Um, how many people here are familiar with genetic algorithms? Okay, great, almost everybody. Um, so basically it's a search-based approach where you represent the solution as a chromosome. Here's our chromosome. You know, this is a semantic group um, that each verb belongs to, the syntactic group, all the dependency mappings. I'm not going to go into all the you can't get it by just looking, but you can imagine that we come up with a structure that actually represents our expert system. And this diagram does not include ontology in it, okay? So that, we deal with that as a separate thing. So we are very excited at being able to use a genetic algorithm to search through this space and to try and kind of learn the right set of rules that would kind of work for our, our solution. Um, but then I sat down one day in the middle of the summer as things were kind of not progressing quite as well as we had hoped. And I thought, how many possible permutations are there in this thing? And it turns out that it would take, you know, at a reasonable kind of like processing, we knew how, how long it took each one to process. It would take this many centuries if we had to run the brute force approach. That is really, really, really large for a genetic algorithm and probably not going to work, which is, so actually in our first um, generation of running the genetic algorithm, I mean, the whole point is you run a generation, you find some solutions, and then you start to kind of, you know, mutate and cross over and improve things. This only works, I have now discovered, if you actually find something in the first generation. You have to have something to work from. So that's not going to work. And um, as a result, you know, we missed the ICSI deadline last fall, <laughs> not surprisingly, uh, and for other reasons, like lots of babies were being born in my research group. Um, okay, so how are we doing for time, though, Lionel? We are Okay, can keep going a little bit? Okay. Um, so actually, just for that previous um, slide, though, um, this one, we actually now think we have a much better way to solve this problem. And I was partly inspired by um, Lionel's talk that I saw a few weeks ago. And um, we think we have a way to kind of restructure this into a multi-objective problem. So I'm excited to try it. And also to obviously massively reduce the search space and search in a kind of smarter kind of way. So we have some ideas for that. And it is going to be our summer project again this year. And we hope that we won't miss the ICSI deadline again. Okay, we did have a little bit better luck in this whole area of um, using genetic algorithms to, um, and I'm only going to talk very kind of short time about this, but um, the actual, so now kind of moving away from the expert system, another area of intelligence that's really useful in traceability is um, the idea of kind of intelligently configuring and composing a trace engine. And I haven't really talked about what goes into a trace engine, but as you can imagine, there's all sorts of things. If you know anything about information retrieval, you know that you have to do things like um, stem terms to their root form because you want them all to match. If you want to do something with code, you have to split the variable names apart. 
Um, you've got to build dictionaries, and there's many different ways that you can build dictionaries. You can build global dictionaries, you can build local dictionaries, you can build them off um, in America off the American National Corpus dictionaries, all sorts of things. There's many, 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 many different algorithms you can put in the middle. Here's just one little example of the vector space model using, using one particular kind of similarity. Um, here's another example of a completely different trace engine. There's many, many hundreds of thousands of different trace engines. And it turns out, I'm going to tell you the end of the story before I tell you the beginning of the story. That pilot study that we ran with Siemens and they said not good enough. Well, right after that we started this work and we found that we would have improved the accuracy of the, of the tracing that we had done in that pilot study by 200% if we had run this and had used um, search-based approach to discover the right configuration. So for their data set, it would have been 200%, um, you know, twice as accurate as it actually was. Um, so anyway, in this research, you know, we want to try and configure, find out the right way to configure the trace engine for a specific domain. Um, so, we, we, so what we did is we took all the pieces that we had available to us at that time we model them as a feature model. So these feature models are typically used for product line development. And um, basically they tell you all of the features that are available. Um, they tell you um, constraints on the configuration, so what cannot go together, and they tell you um, dependencies, like if you have this, then you must have that as well. So we found that we had, you know, Luckily, we're not talking in terms of, um, you know, centuries of runtime, like many, many centuries. And that number, by the way, is also equivalent to the number of nanoseconds in the universe, um, which my physicist friend was able to tell me. We have a very much smaller search space, but of course, as you add new features, that's going to kind of grow. Um, so we, we also used a genetic algorithm approach for this. Um, and I'm going to show you the structure for it. So here's our chromosome structure. This is very, very much more simple than the other one I was showing you. In this case, basically a feature, if it's present, it, it's, um, it gets a one, and if it's not present, it gets a zero. And then some of the features, are, um, we have a slight kind of hierarchy to our chromosome because some of the features have different values that are used to configure them. And um, so the idea is that, um, which I'm gonna go back here. Um, you know, here's our genetic algorithm. We're going to generate an initial random population, check it for validity. So checking for validity means we can't just populate that chromosome. We have to check it against the feature model and make sure that it's actually a valid configuration. Um, you know, you can't have no trace, no trace algorithm in the middle. It's a required, you know, kind of mandatory thing that you have one of those. Um, and then, once we come up with a feature model, we have to have an architecture that can accommodate all valid configurations of that feature model. So it's a little bit like the kind of some of the problems they have in self-adaptive systems. As the system adapts, you have to have an architecture which can accommodate the adaptation. So um, here we basically have our architecture and um, just for simplicity in this first version, we made it a kind of more or less pipe and filter architecture and every um, different part could fit in here, and some of the parts that are um, you know, optional, if they're not there, everything still works. And so our approach basically, um, okay, this is our, uh, part of our implementation um, of the architecture part of it in TraceLab, which is our tool. And um, okay, so we instantiate the configuration, um, we execute it against a data set. So, what we do is once we actually instantiate one of the configurations, then we have to run, we have to use it. We generate trace links, we compute how accurate those trace links are, and that's basically our objective function. We use um, mean average precision. The better the result, then the fitter that particular um, configuration was. So we keep running that through our genetic algorithm, and of course we get our the results. So we asked five different research questions and I'm only going to show you, um, and here's the data sets that we ran it on. You can see there's a number of industry <coughs> data sets here and um, I'll show you the answers to a couple of the questions. First, is there a single configuration which performs well on all data sets? So this is actually a really important research question 
Because do we care if one is better than the others, if there's one that's just pretty good for all of them? So this is actually a core question. Of course, we wanted the answer to be no, <laughs> because if the answer is yes, then our research was not really very cool anymore. Um, the answer is, well, we didn't find it. And um, what we did is we, we took the best result for each data set. So here's the different data sets. The best results have the red triangle on top. We took the best configuration for that data set and then all the triangle um, configurations we tried on all the different data sets. And you can see in each case, the triangle is the winner. And in some cases by significant amounts. Look at this big industry one here. Um, this is actually the one we ran our pilot study on. And the winner was the one that got configured by the genetic algorithm. And then all the other standard configuration approaches just didn't even perform nearly as well. Now, obviously, we need to still do better. Um, when you get a mean average precision of about 0.3, there's actually not bad results. That means you probably have quite high recall, and your precision is um, not that bad, too. But I'm, I'm not going to talk about all of that. Um, OK, so that was one other aspect. And then I want to kind of finish um, by talking about our current, another one of my current projects, which I think is another kind of area of bringing intelligence into traceability. And we've been building this tool, some of you have heard about it before, called Tiki. And um, if Tiki sounds a little like Siri, then there's a reason for it. Um, so it's kind of like Siri with um, trace queries kind of hidden in there. Um, and so you can kind of guess what Tiki does. Um, and one of the things that we saw in industry that had surprised me uh, at some point when I was visiting industry, they told me they had great traceability in place. They, they had to do it because their company insisted on every organizer, every project having traceability so they could reach CMMI. Um, level three, which is a process improvement um, initiative that's kind of more, probably more popular in the States, I think, than in Europe. Um, you have your own. But um, they said we never use those trace links. So they built them, they didn't use them, they never queried against them. So it's like, why? Well, around that time, we found this on this open source kind of forum, I can't remember which one it was now. And this actually kind of epitomizes you know, the difficulty of writing SQL statements that are for meaningful queries that you'd want to issue against your, your kind of trace links. It's complicated. And one reason it's complicated is because every artifact has trace matrices in between it. And um, it's non-trivial. So what we want to do is to introduce a natural language interface for querying traceability data. And we called her Tiki. She is a girl. Um, and, you know, Tiki, can you help me? I need to know whether all my requirements have been covered in the design. Um, this is exactly the kind of question we want people, and to some extent they can right now, um, ask. Or I'm particularly interested in requirements related to the OBU system. So you can see, okay, this is going to need that domain ontology. And in fact, this is actually a query our industry, uh, our industry partners asked us to support and they said, but we don't want just to have stuff that comes back about OBU. We want to have stuff that comes back about all the major components of OBU. Um, do any of them have highly complex source code which recently failed test cases? OK, we can't do this bit yet. We're working on it because that includes and integrates software analytics. But these kind of questions we're getting pretty good at right now. And um, tricky as it stands today, you can speak or write a trace query. Um, we focus on the natural language spoke, um, written ones because basically there's lots of um, already ways for translating speech to text. Um, we spent a lot of time with that up front, then we realized, hey, that's not where the interesting bit of this research comes, it's actually down here. And then we have our SQL generator. And, um, and you could see back here examples of these kind of queries. These are queries, um, are there any hazards with no identified contributing faults? We can answer those kind of queries. Um, the top three we can answer this one is the system safe for use um, we want to be able to answer that kind of question but we're going to have to answer it by having pre-canned you know so in other words if you have some predefined queries that we've already translated into lower level queries 
um, then we can just do kind of matching, query to query matching. We didn't do that yet. And then what about this one? What's up, dude? Um, probably not. <laughs> Although, if Tiki's as good as Siri, it, we should be able to come up with some answer, you know? Like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so here's Tiki. We show them what we call a traceability information model. This is what we give to the user. Given this, we ask, the user can ask any queries about it. So this shows them the artifacts available, the attributes, and we actually give some sample data. This is the current prompt that we give to the users, and they come up with their queries. So from Tiki's perspective, um, we need to know what kind of words and phrases people use because we have to build a, um, a trace query domain model that captures the kinds of words and phrases um, that they want to use. So we've collected quite a bit and we're still in the collection process. Um, so we extract that, those from users and then we also extract lots of terms from the actual data. So from the TIM itself, from the data, the attributes that are in the case tools that store the data, all of this comes out and goes into the vocabulary that we can then understand and interpret in our queries. Um, we did some initial studies. We found that traceability experts really liked um, textual queries, also managed spoken queries. Non-traceability experts did not like spoken ones at all. I think they felt like they're on the spot and they don't know what to say. Um, but you can see that there's a strong preference for these natural language queries over the blue SQL ones. It's not surprising. Um, it's something that, you know. So we constructed this vocabulary. Um, here's our current Tiki flow. I'm not going to have time to go through it. But you can see, um, you know, we import all of the, um, this information. We do pre-processing. There's a lot of disambiguation that goes on here because when the user gives a natural language query, there's usually many ways that we can interpret it, and um, so we have to um, we have these kind of heuristics that we use to disambiguate the query, and now we're adding to it some kind of probabilistic techniques which we haven't done, and then um, this post lexicon processor. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. You can see up here arm movements could translate into um, data in the preliminary hazard description or the unit test name. And um, the disambiguators help us figure out which combination of these things is actually the right answer. Um, here's our Tiki experimental results, actually not our most recent. Um, our most recent ones got worse. And uh, the reason it got worse is because we, um, these were our toy problems. So our first paper we published on toy data sets. Our second paper we've made it much bigger and it's kind of shown us the real problems that we need to deal with. Didn't get horribly worse, but it definitely got worse. So we, we spent months and months and months making Tiki better. And then we published our experiments against a much more challenging data set. So our results got worse, even though Tiki got better. Um, so we're working on it, we'll get there. Um, Okay, so just very quickly, some ideas about transitioning to practice. Um, you know, going back to the kind of traceability thing, um, many times when I talk about traceability, people don't even know what it is in industry. And people say, well, isn't that some heavyweight thing? And then the other thing that I've um, heard, whoops, it'll come in a minute, it's in the wrong order. Um, but then on the other end of the spectrum, where you have these kind of safety critical problems, you know, people know what traceability is about. We have to have it for certification. But as I told you before, well, we hate it, so we're going to do it at the latest time possible. Um, so much of the research I've talked about today is motivated by the traceability needs in safety critical systems. That means that it's not going to be good enough if we, don't, if we only get it half right. We have to build tools that in the end people can trust and we have to learn where is the right place to put the human in the loop. Because we're never, ever, ever going to build tracing tools that we deliver an answer and it is trusted as fact. Humans have to evaluate this. This is for safety critical systems. So we have to learn more about putting the human in the loop. But we do believe that as our techniques get better, that we're going to build <coughs> solutions that are even great for people in agile projects. I mean, if you're, if you're working in an agile project environment and you want to know the impact of a new user story, how much more agile can you get than giving them a tool that will just kind of tell them on the fly? 
So there's nothing about creating kind of trace links and maintaining them there. So we think this will impact. Oh yeah, this is the other thing. Um, I've heard this. I think traceability is a made up problem. Um, but I think that the people who say that don't understand the context of safety critical software development, to be honest. Um, this is um, one, of the pro one of the projects we're working on with our industry collaborators. Um, we have imported a hundred gigabyte of um, kind of domain documents. We've done topic modeling on it. Um, they can click on any one of these topics and they can trace this, this bit is working, this bit is not. So I just cut and paste its stuff in there because we haven't finished it yet. Um, they can click on any of these and go back to the source documents and um, also go forward to the requirements, which is obfuscated in my blurry imagey thing. Um, and then we're going to look at other ways of putting other kinds of models in the middle. This is a topic model, but we want to be able to put kind of domain models in the middle and different things and look and see what's more useful to them. But this is just one example of bringing traceability to them in the way they want it so they can use it how they need to. And I think that's kind of a good way to finish. Um, the Center of Software um, of excellence of software traceability has many resources, growing number of resources about traceability if you're interested. Um, and actually one of the um, tools that we've been working on is TraceLab. So this is an experimental environment, it's plug and play. A lot of the experiments I've talked about today we've built in TraceLab and also make available um, basically as open source. Um, to anybody that wants to use them. Um, well, we just found out a couple of days ago we got more funding for this project, so all the quirky things that um, we weren't able to fix for the last couple of years, we're going to be able to. And um, anybody that likes to join our open source project is welcome. Um, otherwise, that's it. Thank you.